Our sermon scripture this morning comes from the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other, other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see, see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his, into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, oh, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet, and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So even though I was on vacation, I was thinking about preparation for today. And I was thinking about all the things that we all do for others. You know, our families, our friends, our work family, our church family. <clears throat> and whether we think about it or not, in many ways, we are simply extending those hands of Jesus. Hands of caring, hands of love, hands of peace. And I've shared this with you already. I wear many, many hats throughout the week. I work, I go to school, I consult, and I volunteer. And, but I do make time for myself every day to be in prayer and meditation. And I didn't realize how important that time was until I went on vacation, realized how busy I really was when I said, oh, I just use my time differently. But um, it was nice to actually have time to not worry about work, to not worry about school or any other things, and just focus on meditating and prayer and having a lot more time to do that. So that was part of a wonderful four weeks of having not to worry about work or school or other things. And I have an early morning routine, which basically I tried to keep, although we did not walk, we did e-biking. Um, and my friend is not Christian, but he, you know, he's Buddhist. But uh, we have so many of the same type of things that we think about uh, when we meditate or sit in prayer for others. And I always have that jump start to my day because if I don't, I never know how I'm going to be able to interact with people I meet. And sometimes those people are not very nice. Although I have to say, in, on vacation, we didn't really encounter those many people. 
Um, I, broke that, I broke some of that routine a little bit as I traveled to Australia and Vietnam. And two very different cultures when it comes to spiritual awareness. And I was very um, ab able to be very heightened to that. In Australia, it's, it, they're a relatively secular state, quite a secular state. And it's rude, kind of rude, to bring up God in casual company. Although um, my friend's friends knew who I was, they, and he, he would introduce me as um, a theological elder. <laughs> and I don't know, that made me feel kind of very old. Um, but it's interesting because in, in Australia, 43% of Australians claim to be Christian. And I think that there's a combination of secular and Christian is a beautiful combination. There's a lot of beauty in that because that continent is a huge melting pot, very not too dissimilar to us, of First Nations people, colonialists and immigrants and expatriates from all over the world that bring their own special cultures and beliefs into that secular mix. And I was staying in Melbourne, uh, which is one of the top rated cities in the world and I was just enchanted not only by the people but just that general camaraderie of the population and, and all the global variety of foods that were, sh that showcased, uh, were showcased by the many different kinds of eateries from different cultures and we do have that here and uh, it was hard to explain because people thought oh well you don't have this I'm like actually we do the only thing I found that we didn't have was this little cookie cookie with chocolate that was called a Tim Tam, which I got addicted to, which is not a good thing, but it happens. But there was a spirit here that didn't have to be defined by one belief system. Uh, there was a respectful kindness that was in sheer contrast, I found, in some, some of our New England encounters. And people were not perpetually glued to their cell phones. That was a huge difference for me. So people would be dining out and they'd be smiling and having conversations. And I, I see that very differently here where you will see a couple go out to dinner, order their food, and then each person is on their cell phone. And children were very well behaved, extremely well educated, polite. Uh, there was a lot of intergenerational activity, not only in restaurants, but in open spaces where they have walking areas in the city and all that. So it was, it was a huge contrast for me to see that. Uh, Vietnam is predominantly Buddhist, although French colonialism infused the culture with Christian values and some very famous Gothic cathedrals. And what they do is they light these cathedrals up with all kinds of Christmas lights. So we were there for New Year's. And it was really interesting to see one of the large cathedrals in, uh, this, in central Ho Chi Minh City lit up with stars and, and, and Christmas lights and all kinds of different things. And the creche was totally illuminated. It was very beautiful. And um, honoring humanity in Vietnam is very present. Honesty, community, family, intergenerational living, uh, strong values in treating each other with recognition and kindness. Um, we stayed at homestays and, and when we left, people were hugging us. And, and would I go to a hotel and have people hug me here? <laughs> I don't think so. But the people I met and the friends I made who shared the interest and work in my subject of grief and loss were very respectful of who I was. And um, I was able to meet with Grief Australia uh, that I have, that I'm a, where I'm a member. And that was really great because um, they thought that maybe perhaps a spiritual aspect to talking about grief and loss in their work might be of value. So it was really never brought up. And so here I am, this person from Boston, 10,000 miles away, and saying, well, I'm working with grief and loss as well, and I would love to work more closely with you. But those morning routines and how, we, how those routines help us focus on the rest of the day give us great guidance and help us extend sometimes our kindness to others because we've had time to just reflect on ourselves. So that for me is extending Jesus' hands of peace. 
in a very small way. And we know those hands from our reading, those hands were scarred. They were scarred out of love for us as Jesus was nailed to that cross on Calvary. But victory prevailed in, in the Easter message, and that's what that scripture is about. And we carry forth that legacy in our own hands because we are an Easter people. Jesus told his disciples that the world would chastise them. That world was really full of hatred. And that's a harsh word to use. But I also see that today. It's the way we see it and how do we deal with it. And the disciples, of course, were afraid. They gathered, they locked themselves up in that upper room and they were frightened of every single knock on the door. And so I wonder, and maybe somebody can clear this up for me, is that why Jesus entered without knocking? I'm sure he didn't want his followers to live in fear. But he also wanted to assure them that it was truly him. Imagine that. Imagine that. But how? How does this relate to all of us gathered here today as a church? Do we hide ourselves behind closed doors? Are we fearful of genuinely proclaiming our faith and service to a deeply divided and secular society? Do we talk about the wrongs we see with those afraid to accept the truth of their faith? I just heard today that the Catholic Church, uh, I think it's, is it Sean? I can't remember who the bishop is here. They are reducing the age of confirmation for children from 13 to 10. And you know the reason is because by 13, almost all the youth leave the church. And I'm, now I'm going to think about that. Is that the right thing to do? How do we keep our youth in our church after the age of 13? Yeah, my great, my great friend in Australia, my best friend I was visiting, not only told people I was his best friend, but also made it a point consistently that I was a theological elder. And I was kind of humbled by that um, as he acknowledged me as a person of global spiritual understanding. And I wish, I wish when I think about it, that we could all extend our hands out to everyone I know that sometimes that's not an easy thing to do. There, there are just no simple answers as to how we share God's love for others. And our work as believers is not always easy. But among those who are seeking, extending your hand of peace can make a dramatic difference. We are here a suffering society. We are living in a cancel culture, a world of the isolated individual or as a friend of mine wrote in her doctoral thesis after her, ex her extensive travels throughout India, we are just massified individuals. Wrap your head around that. People are in fear of commitment and make, of making choices do not, that do not bring instant gratification to their personal agenda. Well, I could tell you in my experience Observing people living this way has created so many personal struggles for them. Increased depression, we see that here in the States. The inability and associated fear of meeting and talking to a new person who has now become the stranger. Addictions, intimate partner failures. The list is long. So your hands Scarred because you inherited those hands of Jesus. Speak love, redemption, and peace in a world that needs saving. Jesus' hands authenticated his ministry of salvation to the world. And we, the church, is his body on earth. We bear those scars to be authentic in our ministry to others. And Jesus shared his spirit of forgiveness with his disciples. Jesus did not condone violence. 
or for his disciples to be vengeful or hold grudges or be angry toward those who persecuted him. How many times do we catch ourselves to not voice our anger? Anger because somebody has done something wrong to us. They have hurt, hit a very core of our being. How about holding grudges? Not easy behaviors to control. And it's not easy to forgive. But as Christians, we are called to find a way to be the, the solution and not the problem. In some of my work life, I deal with some pretty condescending personalities. Have you ever heard that expression? I will try to make you fail before I accept and respect you. This is prevalent, competitive, a prevalent competitive issue still in the corporate world. I always thought it was a baby boomer thing because when baby boomers grew up in school, we were taught to compete, had to get the best grades, get into the best university. It's not. It's more than just the baby boomers. It's all our generation. And companies pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to consultant organizations to deliver team building programs that foster acceptance and respect. And employee assistance programs are popular with human resource departments to assist employees to modify potential negative or destructive behaviors that are not in line with the organization's culture and work life. I always think that if people went and had a church community where they felt love and camaraderie and had goals toward a wonderful belief that this would go away to a certain extent. D, E, I, and B, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are the new buzzwords of our postmodern humanity. But isn't that just the secular version of what Jesus was talking about? Isn't also, in many cases, it's not recommended that employees speak to each other directly to resolve a personality conflict. Has to have a mediator present. And so how do we, as followers of Jesus, respond to all of this? Not necessarily in our secular setting, but most importantly, in our church families. How do we talk to each other out of love, not out of conflict? We do know, as, as disciples of Jesus, that there is a huge disconnect between the secular world and the religious or spiritual world. This is a separation that promotes the very warnings that Jesus was talking about with his disciples. How can we forgive as a people of faith to reconcile and live in two worlds? How does this work in the church? When we walk out these doors, who do we become? The answer is for all of us to discern. But as we learn from this reading, the hands of peace generate faith, which leads me to Thomas. I love Thomas. I have such, always have such a vivid picture in my mind of this disciple who doubted that the risen one. I suppose because I have been Thomas, Perhaps you have too. But at least Thomas was honest about it. I wasn't always honest. When I was in my university years, I went through a period of questioning my faith and I left the church. A lot older than 13. I think I was about 19. But what brought me back? It was the love of that specific community, the church community where I was not judged I was just loved for who I was. I did eventually return to the church, and eventually I was called to serve. So Jesus extended his hands of peace. Peace be with you, Thomas. Put your finger here. Reach out. Put your hand in my side. See my hands? Those are the hands of faith. We, and we all yearn for a vision of our faith. 
sometimes it's vivid and other times it can be subtle, but always it is affirming. The morning after my husband passed away, it's over eight years now, and it's still very vivid in my mind. It was a warm April day, so I had the back door open to the outside. I sat at the kitchen table with my breakfast in front of me, and I was just frozen in grief. In flew a giant bumblebee. And it buzzed and it circled around me and flew back out the door. Very unusual. I ran out, but I couldn't see it. Couldn't see where it flew, flew out to. So I took that and I wondered, is it a sign that I will be okay? That God symbolically came to assure me in my in my ancient circle, in many ancient circles, it's said that bumblebees are a sign of resurrection. That gave me great hope for my loss. But the bumblebee can also symbolize community, hard work, overcoming challenges, rebirth, and love. So the next time you see a bumblebee, which is usually June, that's their big time they come out of the earth, when it buzzes around, remember that they carry a lot more than just pollen. They may carry you to a profound message about your life and your place in the world. And I'll leave you with that. But I, I was thinking about that for some reason, and I said, I have to share that story. So like Thomas, we are called to believe, even though we do not see Jesus or feel the nail scar in his hands. Yeah, that's all of us. That's all of us. To walk by faith and not by sight means that we are moved to action, not by what we see, but what we believe. Those disciples were transformers of a world in deep darkness. It was a time of Roman occupation, of brutal genocide and cultural control. Is our world any different today as we experience enormous societal divisions? both culturally and monetarily, with international conflicts that threaten the welfare of our global communities, Jesus knows what we need. Jesus had patience not only with Thomas, but with all of his disciples. And what patience, what patience Jesus has with you and me in the midst of all our doubts and all our fears, in the midst of our failings, repeatedly, Jesus comes to us, forgives us, breathes new life in us, and offers us new life in him. The risen God reminds us of our mission to go and share the peace and the joy and the hope of this new life with a world that struggles to find peace, joy, and hope. To sometimes share with words and to sometimes share simply with our quiet presence. We are gently reminded not to doubt, but to believe. How faithful are we? Our hands, our healing hands, our hands are loving hands, accepting hands, forgiving hands. Our hands are the hands of peace. Do you hear God calling you? Peace be with you, Jesus said. Amen. <laughs>